gentleman from Texas is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'd like to uh, recognize Mr. Paul Gilmore, uh, who is a United States Air Force uh, veteran, and uh, he was a judge advocate, so he knows some of the legal problems involved in this thing, and uh, I'd like to yield him five minutes. The gentleman from Ohio is recognized for five minutes. I thank the uh, gentleman from Texas, who is a real American hero, for yielding me the time and I request permission to revise and extend. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the resolution works. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, the resolution we're considering does not do a single thing to help our troops or to achieve the goals of America, our allies, or the Iraqi people. Congress is spending an entire week on a non-binding resolution that even if it passes, will not change the course of action in Iraq. Our time could have been spent much better debating real issues, such as how to most effectively win the war that terrorists are waging on us. Now, personally, I'm skeptical that an increase of 20,000 troops will make the difference and that it will stabilize Baghdad and Iraq. But for me, the question is, to whom should we listen regarding operational decisions in Iraq? Should we listen to the recommendations of the U.S. military or to the politicians in Washington? And as an Air Force veteran, I think we should accept the recommendations of our military. And in that respect, two weeks ago, the General in Command of Ground Forces in Baghdad said, and I quote, by bringing more troops in, it provides us the opportunity to work with them, to provide more time to defeat this threat, which is both an al-Qaeda threat as well as sectarian violence, and end of quote. You know, I have visited in Germany in the medical facilities with our wounded troops from Iraq. A member of my family uh, served a year in a combat zone in uh, Baghdad, and I am incredibly proud of our men and women in the military. They are talented, they are dedicated, they are professional, and they are the best in the world. And we owe them a tremendous debt of gratitude. Now, even though it is not binding, there is, I think, a large omission in this resolution. While it does complement the actions of our military men and women, nowhere does it commit to continue providing funding for troops in the field. And at a time when some in this town are talking about cutting off funding for our troops, I think we should commit to providing full funding for our armed forces as long as they are in the field. Now, there's no guarantee that this troop buildup will be successful or that the Iraqis will succeed in finally taking over the security situation in a responsible way. But what we do know is at this point there is not a better plan proposed which has a chance of victory. And we also know that failure in Iraq threatens the security of the United States, the security of the Middle East, and in fact, the whole world. You know, early last year, I had the privilege of leading a delegation to Asia where we met with the prime ministers of India, of Thailand, and Singapore. And those are all countries that are now and have been under terrorist attack. All of them agreed with the need to cooperate for security purposes and with the importance of winning the war against terrorism in Iraq because of the consequences not winning would have on the rest of the world. Mr. Speaker, this resolution has two purposes. First, it rejects the only plan which has been suggested by military leaders with a chance of success in Iraq. Second, it begins this Congress down a path which ends with cutting off funding for our troops and abandoning our foreign policy because of failed congressional fortitude. I'm opposed to the resolution and opposed to our micromanaging of the war on terror 